Welcome to Spine Conference. Today's lecture will be on spontaneous spinal epidural hematoma. Um, this is an illustrative case of an 81-year-old woman who presented to the emergency room with severe, very acute low back pain. I'm not quite sure what exactly the history is as the history was different. Uh, to the emergency room, she stated she was fixing a light bulb at exactly noontime when the pain began. But when I asked her in the waiting area, she said she gave someone a gentle hug and the pain became uh, severe. But either way, her story was the same in the sense of the um, acuteness of the pain. It was a, an episode of severe pain very, very quickly in her lower back, down her buttocks, posterior thighs, posterior legs, incapacitating pain that became worse very, very quickly and she went to the emergency room due to this same pain. Uh, past medical history significant for lumbar decompression at L3 to L5, right side approach in 2010. It was revised with the left side approach uh, two years later. Um, has your vertical glaucoma, irritable bowel, right total shoulder replacement, cholecystectomy, right femoral neck screw, depression, lumpectomy. She's a retired nurse, um, cigarette smoker, medications, Lipitor, Cardizem, Lexapro, Florifev, Zalatin, Topol, Morphine, Miralax, and she's on aspirin, I didn't state that. While in the emergency room, due to her severe uh, back pain, she was sent for a CAT scan to rule out an aortic rupture, and this was negative. Uh, she had good motor strength um, and normal sensation, and even though it was, um, I think she came in on a Friday, they sent her for an emergency MRI scan due to the severity of her pain. So here's the MRI um, of the lumbar spine, and these are the vertebral bodies, and I wrote down L3 and T12 so you can understand uh, um, where we are. You can see here at L4, L5, there's a little bit of spondylolisthesis. Here's where she's had the previous surgery at L3, L4. She still has a, a disc bulge at that same segment, but you can see here an obvious abnormality where there's a, on the T2 weighted images, <coughs> looks to be a heterogeneous mass in the epidural space. Here's the fecal sac, here are the nerve roots, here's the spinal cord, and there's this very large mass that's a long, um, winding, heterogeneous, has different uh, colors uh, within the spinal canal, and it appears to be uh, extra dural. Here's the CSF, here's the mass, and it's compressing the spinal cord. Here's the spinal cord right here. Here's an, another parasagittal cut. Uh, and you can see it's a very large mass. On the fat suppression, T1, um, you can see, uh, uh, again, same mass, heterogeneous. And on the uh, straight uh, T1, uh, it does not enhance. A thoracic MRI scan was performed as well to see how high up it goes. And it's mostly in the lower thoracic area. A gadolinium dye enhanced study shows that it does not enhance severely on the gadolinium dye, but enhances, it does enhance a tiny bit right here, but the vast majority of it does not enhance. Here are the axial cuts, and there is a small area that does enhance on the gadolinium dye, which is interesting. So if you look at the axial cuts, start where things are normal. Here's a vertebral body, here's the spinal cord, and here's the spinal canal. And you can see the spinal cord takes up less than half of the spinal canal, and there's plenty of room for the spinal cord. So this is the white material here is the CSF. Now we're going um, down the spinal canal or caudal down the spinal canal in a caudal direction. This is a T7 pedicle. At the T7, T8 disc space, um, this is at the very, very beginning of where I think the problem was. And here's the spinal cord, and there's a tiny disc herniation there. This is at the T8 pedicle, and this is the beginning of the mass. Um, and here's the spinal cord. And there is some compression of the spinal cord. You can see the spinal cord is in the center here, but here it's off to the right some due to this mass. T8, T9, things are getting a little worse. Spinal cord is being compressed by this somewhat left-sided process. 
T9. Now you can see this mass is taking up half the spinal canal in the thoracic spine, and the spinal cord has pressure on it. T9, T10. At T10, you can see it gets even larger with almost no area for CSF for the spinal cord. T11, T12 spinal cord is being compressed. T10, T11, definite spinal cord compression. The spinal cord is right around here, and there's this very large compressive mass. Again, you can see how it's heterogeneous. T12, L1 disc space. Again, no room for the spinal cord. L1 pedicle, very little room for the conus. L1, L2 disc space, mass is still present. At L2, the mass is pretty much gone, and you can see here normal nerve roots. These little dots are the nerve roots themselves. So what to do? Let's go back. So 81-year-old woman, reasonably healthy cigarette smoker, and she presents with this severe back pain and what looks to be an epidural mass. The radiologist who read this felt that it was metastatic tumor uh, due to the fact that um, it was heterogeneous in nature. Um, uh, her story was very acute. Um, so she was admitted to the hospital and was uh, set up for, uh, she came in in the evening, set up for urgent um, surgical decompression the next day with the presumption of diagnosis of uh, spinal cord compression from an epidural mass. The plan was a thoracic laminectomy from the very top to the very bottom uh, and resection and removal of this uh, epidural mass off the dura uh, to avoid neurological uh, compromise. And a thoracic uh, laminectomy, a standard laminectomy is performed by making a trough on either side of the lamina and then lifting off the lamina. And when you do this, it's an indirect decompression, and it's this probably the safest way to decompress the spinal cord. So this is a cervical laminectomy, but the process is very similar in the thoracic spine. One trough is made on one side of the facet, the other trough on the other side. Then you finish it usually with a kerosene punch. You make the trough with a burr, and then you remove the lamina. So you can see here, here's an axial cut, here's the spinal cord. You make one trough on one side of the facet, the other trough on the other side with the burr. Then you finish it usually with a kerosene bunch or curette, and then you lift off this lamina. This uh, shows you the troughs being made with the burr on either side of the facet. The lifting off of the lamina, indirectly decompressing the spinal cord. And then at the end, you're left with a laminectomy defect. And if um, warranted, you can perform a foraminotomy. So let's go to the video. Oops, sorry. So this is at the very beginning of the surgery. And from the very outset, I knew this was a hematoma. I saw this uh, black, um, dark, very dark uh, fluid, uh, which um, was clearly um, a um, well-formed uh, hematoma, uh, just you know, 24 hours. Some of it was red, uh, and um, the first step was uh, opening up the inner space and removing some of the ligamental flavor at the very bottom of where I thought the tumor was. Uh, but I saw clearly it was a hematoma, so it changed my plan a little bit. Uh, I could move a lot faster because uh, the hematoma is a lot easier to remove. This is uh, the kerosene punch and the suction. You can see this black. This black fluid is hematoma. Let's see if you can get a better look here. So here, just a second. I think that's better. This is the spinal cord right here, the thecal sac, and this is the lamina, and this black fluid is the hematoma. So I wanted to show um, 
the um, laminectomy technique and the hematoma of a particular level. So here, I think around three levels have been decompressed already, and you can see here is the spinal cord. And what I'm doing here is some finishing touches in the lateral recess where there's some hypertrophic uh, ligament flavum and capsular tissue, some uh, pressure on the spinal cord at these levels from arthritis. So I feel if I'm going to um, decompress the spinal cord, I might as well uh, open the spinal cord up completely. This is white foam, this uh, flow seal, which is anticoagulant, it works very well. So here's the lamina. This is the outer border, one side and the other side. And this is the high speed burr. And the high speed burr makes a trough and thins the lamina on either side. You can see I'm making a trough here on one side of the lamina in line with the lateral border of the thecal sac. And uh, I'm uh, removing some of the middle portion of the lamina just to make it easier to remove. And wax is used for hemostasis, so the, the inner part of the bone is spongy and um, tends to bleed, so wax is used to stop the bleeding. It goes into the um, um, cancellous portion of the bone and it stops the bleeding. So this is uh, removing the lamina um, with a kerosene punch. So I'm, I'm not really, I'm not doing the lamp, I'm not doing the laminectomy um, technique in this case. Um, as it was hematoma and I didn't think it was necessary um, and this is a lot faster and you can see the here's the spinal cord and this what looks like jelly this black jelly like material is coagulated blood and a mature hematoma this is ligamentum flavum here and the kerosene punch is removing the ligamentum flavum fully exposing this uh, hematoma. I think this I think this is the worst level at T12. You can see here there's some hypertrophic ligament of flavum. So this is exposing the hematoma and with the curette I'm lifting the hematoma off the fecal sac removing it. It's, I'm trying to pick it up with a pickup because it's, uh, it's almost a solid substance but not completely. You can see it's halfway. So it's not solid enough to lift off like a tumor and yet not liquid enough to suck off with a suction. So kind of have to do a combination. See here's the curette removing it and sucking it off with the um, suction. And this is at the level of the spinal cord so um, I have to be um, very gentle with the fecal sac uh, to avoid any neurological injury. See here's a little bit of um, ligamental flavum that's left over right here. It's being removed with a kerosene punch. And you can see now the fecal sac is being exposed um, and it's free from the pressure from the hematoma. She has coexisting stenosis, so the question is, <clears throat> do you just remove the hematoma and leave the stenosis intact, or do you decompress it? In my mind, it's not that much more work to fully decompress the spinal cord as long as I don't cause instability, so I proceeded with doing that to get the best uh, outcome. There's always a chance that the epidural hematoma could re-bleed, so if that happens, it's best to have the spinal canal as wide open as possible, as long as you don't cause instability. So you can see here now the spinal cord, uh, unlike before now, is free of this large hematoma which was compressing it. Here's them now going on the other side and I use the uh, flow seal for hemostasis. Here's another level, the next level up now. The lamina has been removed and again this um, black um, dark uh, hematoma uh, is present compressing on the fecal sac. And here's the, the white is the spinal cord. And again,
again lifting off the hematoma. All right, let's go back to the um, the lecture. So spontaneous spinal epidural hematoma, is it common? No, it's very uncommon. Uh, one in a million per year, basically. So if in, a, in the United States, say we're 310 million or so, it'd be 310 cases a year. And any study is no more than 20 patients. It can happen in any age, even children, but it's very rare in children. Usually it's a fourth or fifth decade of life. Most common at the junction of different spinal levels, like the thoracolumbar junction, which is this case, which was T12 and the cervical thoracic junction. It usually extends uh, in, a, in a wide area, a long area. <clears throat> At the very end, it tapers. Uh, so it's uh, where it bleeds initially, it's uh, large, and then it tapers down at the, as it extends over many levels. Uh, half the time, there's no identifying cause. Um, uh, on MRI scan, T2-weighted images is heterogeneous, like in this case, T1 homogeneous, like in this case, and it's not enhancing and those characteristics can differentiate from the other things uh, that it could be. The differential diagnosis is an abscess, vascular malformation, a herniated disc, uh, a plasma cell myeloma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, metastasis, metastatic tumor, acute ischemia spinal cord, an epidural tumor, which is what I thought, uh, which what the radiologist thought was in this case, transverse myelitis, a dissecting aneurysm, acute myocardial infarction. These are just when they present, but the MRI scan is usually abscess or epidural, hema or epidural uh, tumor. Um, the intrathecal pressure is greater than the venous pressure, so it probably comes from an arterial rupture. Uh, you, wouldn't <clears throat> you wouldn't think a venous rupture would uh, cause such a big hematoma because it should it should stop bleeding basically because the pressure of the thecal sac is greater than the pressure of the venous system. Um, the other <clears throat> uh, issue is the spinal epidural veins do not have valves, so as the pressure in the um, abdomen uh, um, increases um, quickly, say like a cough or a valsalva maneuver, someone goes to the bathroom, it can cause um, a high um, a venous pressure and it could rupture. One has to remember that the, the blood has not only red blood cells, but a plasma and platelets and all these things uh, stop uh, bleeding. <clears throat> and this is how you can get an epidural, epidural hematoma from an epidural steroid injection. If a needle goes into the epidural uh, sac area, it can hit a vein, and there's always veins there, and it can cause a bleed, um, by giving, putting pressure on the spinal cord here. And this line here is the dura. Here are a couple cases of um, spontaneous spinal epidural hematomas. This is in a child in the cervical spine. You see the pressure on the spinal cord, and then here's the thoracic area. Now, an abscess can be differentiated because it usually has this enhancing rim on the gadolinium dye, which enhances with the inflammatory uh, area of the abscess. You can see here this ring here over the abscess, and you can see here the abscess is, is ringed on the, on the gadolinium dye MRI scan. If it's a metastasis um, get on gadolinium, uh, it lights up here. So you can see here it's very bright on the gadolinium dyed T1 weighted images. Here's our patient post-op, the x-rays, um, standing, lateral, front view, AP. And here's the patient herself, uh, two weeks after the surgery, she was doing great. Here's the long incision. Thanks for joining me.